Good morning. Morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Oh, yeah. Nicely done. Nicely done. Well, a welcome to everybody, but a special great big welcome to Cheryl mm -hmm. Domingo, who's with us from Tabuk City, Kalinga Province, Luzon Peninsula, Northern Philippines. <laughs> Republic of Philipp the Philippines, uh -huh. yes. It probably took her less time to get here than you say all that. To say all that, <laughs> that's right, yeah. We're looking forward to hearing more from Cheryl later. Cheryl, of course, is Vienna's colleague in to book Refuge of Hope International. And welcome to those of you who have come, especially to hear her. And um, uh, as we enter into our time of worship today, I just want to say that uh, today is about pain and trauma and God's love and healing in the midst of both. His love sent his son Jesus so that there would be healing for pain, there would be forgiveness for sin, there would be restoration from trauma. And why did the father send his son to do such things for us? because he's the father of lights who loves to give good gifts to his children. And we as the ones he has made are his children and he wants to restore our relationship with him. So let's begin, uh, I invite you to stand if you can and we'll sing Father of Lights. Turning. 
Cause every good and perfect gift comes from you. Yes, every good and perfect gift comes from you. Sing it out now. Oh, every good and perfect gift comes from you. One more time. Oh, every good and perfect gift comes from you. Father of love. Every good and perfect Perfect gift comes from you. It's every good and perfect gift comes from you. Comes from you. Comes from you. Bless the Lord. That's who he is. So the next song we're going to do is actually one that I wrote last summer. And um, some of you may remember it. We sang it once in last September at the end of the summer. Um, so, uh, but you guys are great singers. So uh, feel free to jump in and join in whenever you start to feel like you get the hang of it. It's uh, based on Psalm 55, What Will Become of Us, uh, is the subtitle. Um, and I thought of it today because of um, uh, the girls at Trohe, to book Refuge of Hope International, Trohe. When I hear their histories, um, I find myself trying to imagine being them. Of course, I can't do that, not completely, uh, by any means, and none of us can. But we all have a starting place in our lives, don't we? And maybe pain, and maybe trauma, maybe shame, maybe our own pride and sinfulness. Probably all of the above in one way or another. And... Um, all throughout the Psalms, God, through the psalmist, has given us voice to those feelings and expression to the betrayal and the, and the horror of being abused and betrayed, deserted, all of those things. But he's also given us voice through the same psalmist who turned to God. Now, the circumstances of Psalm 55 are not exactly the same as the circumstances of these girls. In some respects, they are because it's about being betrayed. And when you're sexually abused by your own father or stepfather or uncle or brother, the betrayal, the abandonment is unimaginable. Absolutely. And the psalmist experienced betrayal from his best friend uh, and a different sort of betrayal, but the trajectory of his life where he turns it over to God is what we see and pray for in the lives of these girls.
Why does he do that? The Bible tells us that God 
is love. It's because of his love and how deep it is. in prayer. God of healing, God of wholesomeness, we bring our brokenness, our sinfulness, our fears, and despair, and lay them at your feet. God of healing, God of wholeness, we hold out our hearts and hands, minds and souls to feel your touch and know your peace that only you can bring. God of healing, God of wholeness, during this precious moment in, our, in your presence and power, grant us faith and confidence that here broken lives are made whole. Amen. Amen. Amen.
in our home this past week. And, and uh, she's come to share some of her story and the miraculous way that the Lord brought her and our Vienna together. Because they didn't know each other. Even when Vienna was in the midwifery clinic in the city of Kabul, which wasn't very far from where Cheryl and her husband Rod lived, they didn't know each other. And uh, extraordinary circumstances brought them together. And uh, they had almost exactly the same vision about saving girls from sexual abuse. And so the extraordinary thing uh, about that is that is that there's nothing else like this in their province in that part of the, of the Philippines. Nothing else like it. There's a few other ones in other various uh, ed places in the Philippines, but nothing like that where they are. And so it's an extraordinary ministry. And we believe God is behind it because great things have happened. And so Cheryl's going to say, tell some of her story and encourage us as a video later. And we want you to uh, be uh, engaged with that. And it tells a great story about what's going on on the other side of the world. And so great um, hardship, actually, for Cheryl to get here. Uh, she got here, and it's halfway around the world. And Cheryl, we welcome you. May the presence of the Lord be with you. Thank you. Take it away, girl. Um, it's my first time to be using this, you know. In the Philippines, we do not have such mic, maybe. We have <laughs> microphone. But, but really, it's good to be here in the house of the Lord today. Warm greetings all the way from the Philippines. I'm standing in behalf of of your daughter, Vienna, and the Tabuk Refuge of Pope International, and all the girls that are in, our, in the shelter. Remember that our girls are ages 8, 8 years old to 18 years old. We have um, two girls that are more than 18 years old, but they are mentally disturbed. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just so amazed. Uh, you know, it's my first time to travel all the way outside Philippines, um, traveling for 13 and a half hours, coming over. My first time to see the beautiful mountains. My first time to see the snow. I was able to see the snow. But yeah, the Lord it has truly blessed your country, Canada. And I'm, I'm just so happy to be here with the, all of you. And I believe that uh, it is God who ordained this day to be with you all. Uh, I just want to give a background story of where I came from. Since, you know, in the Philippines, um, maybe you have heard, you can Google it, Philippines. But Philippines is, um, we call it, there's the northern part. Um, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. So if you would see this, this portion, that is Luzon, the head of it, of the Philippines. And you go on the middle, yeah, that is Luzon all the way. We call it, uh, and at the same time, Northern Philippines. And if you go at the middle, that is Luzon, Visayas. And at the bottom part, that is Mindanao. So in the Philippines, we came from different uh, cultures too. Uh, we do speak in different language. Um, I mean, it's good that I was able to speak in English because our national language is Filipino or Tagalog. So in, in our national language, there's Tagalog. Thank you, Sister Karen. Then in there's another tribal language that we do, which is Ilocano. Then there's another again. So it's like we speak four, five languages. Uh, first of all, before I would read the background history of Kalinga province where I came from, I would just like to say thank you to all the Moiliet family who welcomed me warmly coming over here. It, it feels like home. Thank you so much. We had a chance to go over the ranch, see all the beautiful 
ships, the trees, and the mountains. It's like from one plateau to another plateau and another, and all these beautiful creeks around. You are very rich in um, water. In the Philippines, we run out of water. Like there's a day that the government would say that, um, okay, uh, Monday there's water, but Tuesday, no water. So we have to have these big drums, like the barrel drums that we do in the shelter since we are 15. So we like one, five, five barrel drums that we fill in to make sure that it would go for the rest of the day. But yeah, you are blessed with water. I'm so amazed. <laughs> anyway, I'll start over with this. Kalinga is a landlocked province in the northern part of the Philippines within Cordillera Administrative Region. History tells that its name is derived from the Ibanag and Gaddang noun word, Kalinga, which means enemy, fighter, or headhunter. Since its separation from the former province in 1966, Kalinga was known as headhunter and even considered as a place of no return. This was misconstrued by neighboring provinces. During those times, tribal wars and inter-village conflicts were still known and this affected the lives of the people the education of the students, the economic activities, health and other social services in concerned community are temporary stop. Aside, Kalinga was not exempted from the incidence of insurgency due to geographical terrain that is generally mountainous. But as years pass by, when Christianity spread in the province, many changed. The headhunter was transformed to a peace-loving province where unity among the people had been born. This time, Kalinga is now being recognized around the globe. The Guinness World Record certified two titles for Kalinga. It is largest gong ensemble with 3,440 male participants and largest clay pot dance with 4,681 female participants that were performed in the program called A Call of Thousand Gong, A Dance of Thousand Pots. This has not been attained without the cooperation and unity among the leaders and community people of the seven towns and one city. The dreams of our, our forefathers are now towards its realization. Evidently, socioeconomic status in the province greatly improved. But then, it is so disheartening that as the economy of the province improved, Social problems also rise. This includes the increase of cases in sexual abuse. Sometime of 2019, I believe that it was God's way that I came across Vienna Moiliet, your daughter in Vavendai, with Elora. In one of our conversations, we were sharing all these dreams and aspirations we have in life. And it was God who needed it together that we had the same vision of putting up a shelter someday to help girls in need. We have witnessed how God has favored our dreams. I finished then my social work degree while Vienna and Elora has finished their, completed their midwifery. During the pandemic, Sexually abused girls increased and recorded about 1,400 in northern Luzon alone. If we remember the pandemic, it was started, it started in our place from March 2020 to May and June 2020. And it went up to 1,044 girls in northern Philippines alone. All the more, this motivated us to push through our dreams. Our church and the congregation that is pastored by my husband 
was then willing to allow us to use the space beside the church building for renovation. And the book Refuge of Hope started its operation in June 1, 2020. In few days, two girls were referred to our shelter. This grew into 13 before the year ended 2021. It is heartbreaking that most of the cases that they will brought to our doors are incest, as, as the perpetrators are either father, brother, uncle, or neighbor. As such, the victim survivors really need to be pulled out from their houses or communities where their perpetrators are still at large and court hearing of cases are still ongoing. At the early part of this year, 2023, two of, two of, our, girl, of our girls from the 13 were integrated to their family. But however, four came before the end of the first quarter, which is around February this year. There came another four girls. The book Refuge of Hope International, as a member of Provincial Local Council on Anti-Trafficking and Violence Against Women and Children, made its services to the seven towns one city of Kalinga province and even communities of the neighboring provinces. At present, we have 15 girls in the shelter, which means that we have gone through the maximum capacity of the shelter that we, need, that we are supposed to. However, we could hardly close our doors if somebody comes in. We could hardly reject or refuse victim survivors, especially if, there are, if their perpetrators are members of the family. The present setup of Trohi has exceeded the maximum number of residents. The provincial government of Kalinga has recognized the big role since we are the first shelter in the province. They started to pour some assistance like goat raising, which uh, under the livelihood program, they started to give chicken uh, under still the livelihood program. We know and how and feel how God is blessing this ministry. And amazingly on our third year of operation, our dream of having a land where we could have a wider space to shelter the kids was realized through the help of concerned organizations. So we were able to buy um, a land for the shelter. This has been taken through your help as a local church here in Vavinbay. Every, every amount matters to us most. Trohi was able to acquire these three hectares. We then prepared for the site development plan for its utilization. We plan to construct a 25 capacity shelter with complete facilities and fixture. This won't happen without all of us helping hand in hand together as we, as we set this goal. At this juncture, in behalf of the book Refuge of Hope Home, I humbly come knocking at your doors again, again to help us in this endeavor. We believe that God will bless you more in extending the help of our, to our victim survivors, and may God bless us all. Amen. Um, I made it sure to really write it on a paper for me not to forget anything but but really um we have seen and witnessed how god has been moving to our girls before i left the philippines uh, just this um april we accepted one girl who is um we said that we are really full we are already 15 and here comes her coming to be number 16 he was, she was taken, being taken advantage by a neighbor and got pregnant due to the 
due to the raid. It was hard when we, we took her. We, since she has mental delays, and so that's, that's one of the reasons why the neighbor took advantage of her. And um, since Vienna is a midwife, so uh, she is the one who oversees every process of it. We had her full ul for ultrasound, for checkups. And you can see that um, she is not even aware that she is pregnant. She is not even aware that there's a baby inside of her. So we really have to teach her that, you know, you have to be careful in your movements. You don't just run. Remember, she is just 15 years old. Um, we prayed for her through the process. And um, it, was, it was so hard on our part because we have been, we have been keep on praying and praying for her. Uh, Vienna also tried to, you know, explain things out, the cycle, and they even tried to get um, a sample of a baby uh, to really emphasize and explain it to her that there's really a baby inside of you. And um, one day, uh, there's a bleeding that happened. And I was like, Lord, uh, what if something you know something and it keeps it keeps bleeding up to three days so i uh, vienna said oh we have to bring it to the hospital so by the time that they brought it to the hospital really she lost the baby and um you can see that uh since you know there is a mental delay just after she was uh, discharged from the hospital and we brought her at home she was getting this uh, doll and, you know, putting it uh, and trying to take, uh, you know, do that. And we were like, oh, no, there's, uh, like, subconsciously something something is happening in her that, uh, you know, she, she lost it. She knows that she lost it. But, yeah, so those are the... Those are the things that is happening around there. The, the youngest that we had before was um, uh, seven years old. And she started um, telling it to the teacher. She said, uh, this is happening. And so when the teacher um, asked for help, since uh, in, in our place, uh, it's like one day high going to the mountains. You know, I can see a lot of mountains over here. It's like one day hike, they would go to the mountain. And that's where this, that even through your walking, through your hiking, you could, uh, along the way, you could encounter lich, you know, that would just be flying on your face. And so this these kids, they came from that area. And it took years that they've been taken advantage by their uncles. It's good that the youngest was able to, you know, disclose it to the teacher and finally uh, we were able to rescue them we did not go to the we did not go to the mountains but the police officers was the one who brought them into the shelter at first glance you would you would see that when it comes to their weight they are totally thin when it comes to it's 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 not normal at all and is structured they don't have the imagination of you know a family a father a mother who is loving because it's their family itself who hurt them but uh yeah as they come over we help them it's going to be a process it's a long way process moments that you know talk with them talk with them you, you have to teach them what is the normal family structure. You have to teach them that you care for them, that you love them, because they don't trust anyone at all. Be and so, so many things that uh, is happening there, but the victory over all the stories is that God is moving in their lives. I once had a visitor a lawyer who came and he said, Ate, I could not observe any scar among these girls. 
what's your secret tool of doing such? And you know, the answer is Jesus alone is the answer. If they would co come to just commit themselves to Christ and they would just surrender it all at very young age, God is going to move so powerfully in their lives. And you can see, you can see how God is healing them. Yes, it's not, you know, it's not immediate healing, but every day there's, there's, there's an improvement, there's an improvement of their children. So today, I would just want to encourage each one of us in this room that it reminds me of the verse in 1 John 1, 5 that it says there that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Satan, Satan wants to destroy the future of these children, but no way. The Lord Jesus, the light shines, and that that light is Jesus alone. As he says there, that I am the light of the world. Whoever comes to me will not walk in darkness, but will have light, the light of light. You know, um, how are we going to reflect the light of Christ? It is by doing his will. It includes doing what he commands us to do. And there's a verse that it says in Second Corinthians that for what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as our Lord and ourselves as a servant of Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine on the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displays in the face of Christ. I do believe that, you know, um, yesterday, uh, Pastor Ian brought me to, to the ranch and I saw my first time. There is no such apple tree in our place. What we have in our place is mango trees. So, so I believe that all mangoes in the in Canada is all imported. In the yeah, in the Philippines is all apples are all imported. And I remember that it's a story that it says that there was a teacher who once was once explaining the purpose and meaning of our lives here on earth. In one of his many points, he asks, does the mango tree or does the apple tree eat its fruit? That's the question. And so, of course, the student says, no, apple tree grow to be large and beautiful and become so fruitful that others can enjoy and come and eat the fruit from the tree. The tree also becomes a place of shade and a shelter in its limbs and under the shadow of its leaves. That is who we are. We are to be fruitful. And there is a great purpose why we exist as believers. The Bible tells us that we, have, we live and serve willfully. We honor God. When we serve others, his desire was for us to use our diverse types of gifts from him to benefit the people around us. Serving, I remember, um, I see Brother Darcy over here. I'm just so, uh, I'm so thankful, Brother Darcy, because when we went to the, the ranch of Sarah, we had the horseback riding. And I'm just amazed on how Brother Darcy serves. You know, the, the very first time that I met him, he's so welcoming, telling what to do on the, since it's my first time. We have horses in the Philippines, but it's like this, funny, <laughs> and it's very thin, but yours are like huge. Uh, I have to step on a wood for me to get in. And I was telling Brother John that, you know, on the on the step foot they have to adjust to the yeah the stirrup they have to adjust it to the last hole for my for my leg <laughs> 
<laughs> but he's still uh but yeah i just i'm just so so blessed to meet the uh, brother darcy and he cook he cook food for us for for lunch and it's so encouraging i mean that's 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 the heart of jesus that we serve we encourage we you know we give our hospitality we intercede to people that are in need and of course in our each one of us has something that we offer it is also vital to note that we will receive different results but what is most important is that we volunteer and serve one thing more is that I observe here in Canada, it's like they keep work, 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 work. Well, in the Philippines, uh, there, are, there are a lot of people that, you know, they're not um, given the opportunity to work. That's why there is underemployment in the Philippines because many are capable and qualified, but there's no work to do. But in here, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I mean, you're so blessed. There's a lot of job to do. But uh, it's an encouragement that work and serve with passion. As it says there that don't hesitate to be enthusiastic. Be on fire in the spirit as you serve the Lord. That is taken from Romans 12 verse 1. Serving God is one of the important principles of a Christian faith as believers we are expected to help the church with a joyful spirit, love one another, care for one another. I see the culture in Vaban by church. Pray for one another, encourage one another, help one another. As each of us has received the gift, use to serve one another as a good stewards of God's grace. Amen? Amen. And also, it says there, last point, Pastor Ian, it says there that it, the Bible reminds us that we should work with quality, with excellence in all the things that we do. Sometimes people, something that people will value upon the time that they met you. It says there that in Colossians 3.23 that Work at everything you do with all your heart. Work as if you are working for the Lord, not for human masters. Work because you know that you will finally receive the reward as a reward what the Lord wants you to have. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, it's uh, just as the body... Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. Our faith in Jesus and our journey to become more Christ, more Christ-like would lead us into good work. Um, remember that our life in the Philippines, the life span, most Filipinos, their life span is only around 70 above. 70, 71, uh, 70 below. Good if they have survived up to 72. I do not know. Maybe because of the food that we eat. Maybe because we do not have dairy products in the Philippines. It's so hard to have uh, milk. That's so expensive to, to have milk in the Philippines. It's all imported. But, you know, in that, in that life, that we have each one of us in this journey it's only one life to live and i believe that you know if we just do it all for god we are going to see and witness great and mighty things in all the things that we do amen amen, amen. and um the lord bless us all uh, I, I just want to show uh, a video before I, I would close and uh, Pastor Ian would uh, come. There is a call from the Lord to protect and love vulnerable children. We have answered that call. And this is a story of lives changed forever. From my earliest memories, I was helping my parents in the ministry. They were pioneers of gospel, and planted dozens of churches in the region. Growing up, I felt the 
life-changing of impact of rescuing children because my parents were once those children raised in an orphanage. My siblings and I witnessed our parents' lifelong commitment to their calling and the impact of God's work in the lives of the people that they ministered to. Today, we are all serving the Lord in the ministry and my husband, Rod, pastors a local church. One day, during the time of one-on-one -on -one counseling in our local church, my eyes were opened to the abuse that many of them were silently facing. With no resources for young vulnerable girls in our city, I felt so compelled to do something. Then I returned to college for social work to prepare for the ministry that I would give the girls help they desperately need. I first came to, to Book City in the Philippines as a midwife student. Uh, during those first two years, I really began to see a need for a ministry for women and girls who had suffered at the hands of others. So after graduating from my midwife studies, I returned to the Philippines and I volunteered at a women's shelter in Manila area to really learn about how to minister to victims of abuse. Mutual friends connected me with Cheryl and when we got together, we realized that we actually shared the same vision to protect and restore children in the Tabuk City area who have suffered greatly by other people. Uh, during my years here in Kalinga as a midwifery student, I had one patient who was a 16-year-old girl. Um, she found herself pregnant and attempted an abortion that failed. And she was so scared and so withdrawn, and I really felt compelled to help her. Um, and this experience really opened my eyes to the need for a ministry here to support and love these young girls. Kalinga is a beautiful mountainous province surrounded by different cultures and traditions with agricultural communities spread out even in the most remote places. Just as it is all over the world, Perpetrators exploit children that are most vulnerable. But here, there are things that make the situation even more devastating. In some cases, physical isolation can lead to long-term abuse going undetected. The cultural bondage of shame can often silence victims out of fear of the dishonor they will bring onto their family. The abuse these children endure is unimaginable and shape their perspective of who they are. Many times these children suffer unthinkable abuse from those that should be loving and protecting them. We are taking a stand for these girls, giving them a safe place to grow and flourish surrounded by the love of Christ. We believe that God has called us to open the first and only home in the Cordillera region to rescue the victims of abuse. We envision a safe place with a loving family environment where every girl is holistically restored, mentally, physically, and spiritually. We want them to see their own lives from a new perspective as one with honor and value. <laughs> the lockdowns that occurred due to COVID-19 only increased the trauma that many of these girls live with. So despite the struggle with COVID and everything that was happening, we were still able to open during this time so that we could help these girls during their greatest need. So we renovated an addition on our church for the home. We went through the long and difficult process of registering and licensing with the Department of Social Welfare and Development in order to ensure that we really were offering these girls the best help that we possibly can. The DSWD social workers bring us each new girl. At first sight, the girls are so thin and withdrawn. They often don't respond when they are spoken to, and their nights are full of tears with fear that their abuse may continue. As we provide love and assurance to these girls, we see them begin to heal 
Every day we see small victories and they're really growing in confidence. Over time, we see the girls begin to trust us and they were able to interact and play um, like children should. They have responded to the love of the Lord and their faith is growing. We can see their perspective on their life shift and for the first time, they begin dreaming about their future. We knew that the need was great, but never imagined how quickly we would grow. The challenge of our current facility is not only the limited size, but central location. Because of the sensitivity of our cases with the girls, we need to protect them from the public eye. We found an incredible piece of land that's ideal for the girls to heal and grow. Our friends and supporters responded generously, and in November of 2021, we purchased the land that's the future site of Refuge of Hope. We have a multi-phase development plan for our 3 hectares or 7.4 acres of land. This first phase would be the construction of our residential facility where our girls would call it home. It will be housed with 25 girls and 4 staff. We want to build a home where these girls can just be kids, able to play in the backyard and grow plants and garden, care for animals, and we want them to be able to hear the songs of the birds in the trees. But most of all, we want them to be able to listen to God's voice in their life and that they can truly find healing. Would you respond to the call and partner with us to build a facility that will change the destiny of our girls? Thank you. Um, I would just uh, end it before Pastor Ian would come. There's the verse in the Bible that it says in Matthew 25, 27, 37, it says there that the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see a, a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes or and cloth you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Once again, I thank you for Vaven by Church for all your support. It gives us a lot of strength. Every time that you pray for Trohi, we would just fill it in our hearts. We fill it from the Holy Spirit, and it gives us strength to keep on and keep on. God bless us all. Thank you so much, Cheryl. You know, the Christian faith is about partnership. We, we've, a little church here, been given an opportunity to partner with some things that are going on on the other side of the world. Sometimes we're afraid of littleness. Do we get afraid of littleness? I, I sometimes look around and say, oh, I'm so small. I look around and say, oh, my influence is so little. And we look around our little church, our church is so little. Our community of Bavenby is so small. But God doesn't look at littleness like that. We know the story in the Bible about a little boy, apparently a little boy, who was following Jesus on the multitudes, and it was decided it was lunchtime, and no one had food except this little boy had a lunch. <laughs> what good is that? What good is a little lunch amongst thousands of people? 
Jesus couldn't use that, could he? But somehow the little boy gave his little lunch to Jesus. And Jesus made something little into something big. So Cheryl, you kind of encourage us to not be fearful of smallness. Scriptures talk about a, a mustard seed that grows into a tree. And if we have faith like that, that is the kind of faith that God is pleased with. God is pleased with small seeds that grow into something that is large. Your faith, our faith together can grow things that are large. May we not be fearful of littleness. Jesus went to the cross. He went and gave his life willingly for the things that we have done wrong. And he offered forgiveness. And that's not a little thing. That's a big thing. These girls are coming to learn about that. I think I'm right in saying that it's like 99%, almost 100% of these girls come to faith. Because the love of Jesus is being modeled to them. Scripture says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So we're enjoying the love of Jesus every single day. These girls see the love of Jesus through the team, the Trohe team. They're loving them. And they're moved by that. In a way, we've all been rescued from something, right? We've been rescued from sin. Even the good people in this world have sinned. Billy Graham said this throughout his ministry that he needed forgiveness. And Billy Graham said, he said, I needed the cross of Christ. I needed him. So that's why we participate on Sunday mornings, the Lord's Supper. Because we are reminded by this who we are and who Jesus is. So as the plate is passed and as the opportunity to take the, the bread reminds us of the body of Jesus that was given as we drink the cup. It reminds us of his blood that was shed. And it's a celebration of appreciation. So God bless us this morning, Joseph. That was a very powerful presentation, Cheryl. Thank you. And um, I think just as a thought, as we're partaking of the meal, this tradition that Christ left with us, um, at least I feel compelled to think if Christ gave everything, what can we give for the kingdom? Mm -hmm. And what's our part? Christ gave everything. He gave his blood. He gave his flesh. And, um, and I believe he called us to give everything as well, in a way. Lord, as we partake of this amazing meal that you, you left with us to remember your incredible sacrifice that can be unparalleled. We just ask that your spirit will grow within us and will work us and move us in the direction that you want us to go to build your kingdom to further the boundaries of your kingdom, to grow your family. And we just thank you so much for this opportunity to listen, um, to see firsthand, secondhand, what's going on in just another part of the world. The lives that are being changed, the members that are being added. 
and we just continue to ask for your blessing on the Trohi, Trohi mission. And we can see that your hand is there, Lord. 